afternoon, everyone. Here is Henriette Dybkjær from the home studio in Hellerup. Uh, I'm looking forward to uh, spending half an hour with you and with our guest from China. Um, tidbits this week will be only this one because next week we will have not less than three tidbits for your lunch. So uh, stay tuned for the program that we will give in uh, later today. But um, we are looking forward to 15 minutes of uh, great knowledge about the situation in China. That's both about how is the economical situation, like what will be made in China in 2025. That is what you're going to know after this, uh, this tidbit. And um, Martin, he has been uh, living three years in uh, Southern Korea, where he has uh, been the leader of the innovation team of uh, invest in Denmark and uh, now he has just transferred uh, himself and his family to Shanghai where he has been since uh, this summer and he's the director there. So let's just get started. Um, I was supposed to have some uh, Chinese tea but I couldn't find any in my cupboard so Martin uh, let's have a toast. This will be in uh, Danish coffee in my daughter's uh, homemade uh, mega musel cup for my birthday a couple of years ago. So it's not Chinese porcelain either, but uh, a toast with you, Martin, for a great tidbit. Cheers. I hear that you're also drinking coffee and not Chinese tea. So, but um, let's get started. I will uh, put you up in full screen, Martin now so you can say hello hello to our dear guests out there in the landscape thank you very much uh, Henriette. i hope that uh, you can both see me but also uh, hear me uh, i want to to thank uh, malak for giving me this opportunity to actually speak a little about uh, some of the things that is uh, happening here in china especially in, in shanghai where i'm now located as the executive director for the innovation center denmark as uh, Henrietta pointed out, I was three years in, in Korea before this uh, this posting. So uh, Shanghai and China is still fairly new to me, but I have worked with the team for quite some years also when I was in Korea. And I worked with uh, Marlock before uh, they changed their name uh, and they were called the Maritime Development Center. So we have some insights also from um, what we were uh, doing back then. And, and hopefully we can also take that uh, forward into a China setting. But uh, the headline for today's presentation is mixing blue and green and adding innovation. Of course, because I'm within the innovation field, but uh, basically also because what we can see is that everything is going to be uh, focused on uh, the green transition. And being very focused also on the maritime sector here in, in China and before that in Korea, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it goes without saying that uh, this green transition is also going to be transferred into the blue sector, into the marine and maritime sector as well. The agenda for, for today's 15 minutes is uh, just a short intro to uh, the Innovation Center in Shanghai and some of the services that we provide for the Danish stakeholders and what we actually do and why we're here. What's the raison d'etre? What's the purpose of having these innovation centers from uh, the from Denmark side? Also, want to give a little context on the Chinese R and D landscape, and in understanding also what is going on here in China, it's very important also to understand and to look out for the policies and uh, and the politics that is uh, simply framing the development uh, that we see in 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 the uh, right now, but also in. in the, in the years to come. And lastly, of course, a very uh, specific look at the maritime sector and the very big investments in, uh, in China. First of all, just a, a brief introduction to uh, the Innovation Center. The Innovation Center was uh, created a decade ago basically to take home knowledge from these innovation hubs around the world. The first one being the one in Silicon Valley, basically because they wanted to be close to uh, this uh, booming tech industry, um, which has a lot of effect on uh, Danish jobs, Danish uh, companies, and, and, and Danish uh, lives, I would say. So the Innovation Center in Silicon Valley was created both so they could help uh, Danish stakeholders, uh, public institutions, companies, researchers, to, uh, with their strength positions, 
and that focuses to actually team up and partner with the key stakeholders in the local setting in, uh, in Silicon Valley. That was a huge success. So other innovation centers was also created along the way. And Shanghai was among the first ones to actually be, uh, be located in, in the China setting. And we're in Shanghai because uh, what we see in Shanghai is that there's a big business community out of Beijing, of course, we have the regulatory framework, all the policies being shaped. But in Shanghai, you have the business settings and you have a very big uh, and large community of, uh, of Danish uh, businesses already situated. And then, of course, you have the maritime sector, which is very much focused on Shanghai and some of the ports in, in this area. Uh, as you can see from this map, we have innovation centers around the world. And we are basically an organization that is uh, created under two different ministries. It's the Ministry of Higher Education and Research in Denmark, and it's the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Denmark as well. So uh, what you may know from uh, working with colleagues in the trade department, what we do is to, uh, to take home knowledge from, uh, from these uh, innovation hubs so it can be used for, for shaping also the future in, in Denmark. Just a little brief on uh, who I am. I, I'm a political scientist. I have work ex experience from around the world. I have been an, the lead advisor in East Africa for four years. I was an international director with the responsibility of international research and education collaboration at a University of Applied Science, where we uh, set up an office in, in Vietnam. And uh, that was sort of my first uh, taste of uh, the Asian uh, region. I've been an executive director in the, in the career setting and now I've been transferred to, to Shanghai, where I'm hopefully going to be for, for many years to come uh, as well. If we look at the, the raison d'etre, uh, just a few words. We uh, want to provide Danish research institutions and companies with access to local knowledge, networks, technology, capital and market opportunities. And maybe just to take you a little bit back, what we did do with the, the MDC collaboration in, in Korea was basically to work with them on a, a project called Efficiency 2, which was looking at the digital uh, platforms for, for the maritime industries. We signed an MOU uh, with uh, the Transport Innovation Network, which is part of Marlock and, uh, and a Korean entity as well. And we did a maritime innovation sprint, uh, whereby we were looking at challenges uh, that was posed to SVAC and DESMI, and also did this project called Decarbonize. So we're bridging academia uh, and industry and, and creating market opportunities. Um, this is the team in Shanghai, and uh, under the lovely pictures here, we, I have written some of the focus sectors for us. I have a good colleague, uh, Thomas, who's the innovation attaché. He's uh, linking up with the uh, research partners. We are looking into fintech and green tech, life science and uh, broadly ICT. And uh, we have a very skilled team to, to support the Danish uh, stakeholders. If we take a look at the Chinese R&D landscape, um, what we can see is that there's a steadily growing um, in and increasing R&D budgets. Um, it's uh, roughly 0.5% uh, of the GDP uh, are invested into, into R&D, and that's, uh, that's the growth rate. Uh, right now, we're waiting for a new five-year plan from, uh, from the Chinese government. And uh, today, we have approximately 2.2-2.3% of GDP in China focusing on R&D. And I think the most important part here is to also focus on or to emphasize that the R&D budget in, in China is very focused on applied science. So it means that it's very applied into industry. So it can actually uh, ha have a return of investment from a Chinese point of uh, perspective that can turn into job creation and, and, and more, uh, more growth uh, in, in the whole of China. They're very much utilizing the private sector as it's driving uh, the innovation forward. So it means that they actually channel a lot of funds into, uh, into private companies to, uh, to boost their innovation. They also, uh, they're also doing quite a lot of uh, experimental research and uh, that's, uh, that's both when it comes to new technology, there's a heavily investment into 5G and IoT. There's a strong focus on information and communication technologies as uh, 5G, sim uh, simply because 
everything is connected and it's the internet of things so uh, it's very applied it's very focused on also what we call stem it's the science technology and engineering math uh, competences and they're very strong in in those fields so it means that we have a, a very huge talent pool here in, in china coming out with these competences and there has been a lot of discussion in denmark that we are very creative and innovative but we are lacking uh, talents and bright minds when it comes to the STEM competences. But there's a strong focus on, on these uh, competences in, uh, in China. Uh, oh, sorry, I'll just go back here. Um, if we look at just China abroad, just for a second, uh, there's been a very, um, uh, they have been very focused on M&A and, and innovation through uh, acquisition, uh, acquisitions. Which is uh, usually debated, not only in Denmark, but also uh, in, in the EU. Uh, I'll come back to some of the policies and also uh, the tech war between US and, and China and how that uh, affects the EU and, and, of course, also Denmark in, in that connection. So, uh, Henry Elias actually mentioned this. What, the, what can we sort of um, expect from, uh, from China in the coming years? Well, some of the things that we can see already now was uh, pointed out in this Made in China 2025. Um, and, and one of the sectors that are um, interesting for, for you and relevant for, for this short talk is, of course, the, the maritime engineering equipment and high-tech vessels. So there's a lot of uh, emphasis on, uh, on providing support to, to this exact industry, also in, in terms of R&D. So this is the strategic plan by the Chinese government, basically to transform this uh, transform con uh, this country into a global high-tech powerhouse across ten key sectors. So these are some of the key areas to to focus on uh, if you want to look at where the investments are going. But also now that we're waiting for this new uh, five-year plan, where it's going to be uh, even more concrete on how this investment is, is going to, to take form in, into these different sectors. If we look at uh, some of the policies and, uh, and, uh, and politics that are shaping the landscape right now, it, uh, it goes without doubt that this trade war between the US and, and China is very much uh, putting everything into perspective. Um, Pre-Trump and pre, uh, pre the election of, of Trump, um, Asia's supply chain was very China-centric. And if we take some of the numbers, we can see that uh, today uh, China is very much looking for, uh, for diversity, but they are also very much looking for um, uh, supplying uh, the region out here and, and some of the countries that, uh, that are actually supporting them. So there's a close connection to, uh, the, to how these tariffs were imposed on China, but also on the other way that China also imposed tariffs on, on, on the US. And that is really shaping the, the global supply chains. Asia, Asia's winners in this US-China trade war uh, are the ones that has linked up uh, closely with uh, China. But, uh, but there's also been, uh, been Japan and Korea that has now been linked uh, closer to the US. Uh, whether that is going to change uh, post-election, um, who knows? Uh, some of the things are, are probably going to stay for, for a little longer time than, than just uh, the, current, uh, the current administration in, in the US office. If we look at some of these supply chain, uh, just a second. If uh, we look at some of the supply chain reactions, uh, what we can see uh, here is that um, uh, it, it needs a little review on this uh, escalation of, of tariffs and the impact on the trade patterns. But as you can see, for instance, in, in the bottom uh, right corner, the Chinese exports to selected countries uh, has increased uh, quite a lot. Uh, but uh, of course, the exports to the United States has uh, dropped down uh, due to the tariffs. So some of these global supply chains and uh, supply patterns uh, has shifted quite a lot during the, the last year or a couple of years. Um, 
if we look at uh, some of the other things uh, that we can also see, uh, some countries are turning inwards. So there's a global tendency towards this uh, self-sufficiency. I would say it's even a, a policy buzzword. It's already part of China's policy framework, especially when it comes to ICT and this uh, before mentioned plan of the 2025. Uh, I don't foresee that that, uh, that is going to, to change very much. Um, China is very much uh, focusing on being self-sufficient in some of these key areas where they want to be very strong. So, uh, and, and we can see that there are similar trends uh, from, from other countries uh, here as well. And, uh, and the trend is, is also going uh, in, in EU and, and the US. Techno uh, technology is very much in, in focus uh, from, from both sides. So it means that uh, both the US, the EU is a little afraid of, uh, of the China investments into key technologies. But uh, I'll come back to, to some of the things because uh, there's still a room for, for a lot of progress and a lot of growth when it comes to critical components in the maritime uh, sector. So uh, how will this uh, play out in the different sectors in China? Well, in terms of industrial policy, we expect that the policy to aim to match domestic supply chains more closely with the structure of domestic demands, meaning that China will very much focus on China and the region here and becoming more uh, sufficient and, and a powerhouse on some of these key sectors. Um, so rather than promoting exports, industri industrial policy and support will focus on choke points where China seems to have a dangerous alliance on, on, on imports. Just a few other statistics as well that can uh, just uh, support some of the key points here that we see a changing pattern in, uh, in, uh, in the exports uh, from, from China, but also the exports from, uh, from the US to the Asian market. Uh, I know we don't have a lot of time, so I will share the, the presentation afterwards so you can see some of the slides and, and take time to, to go through them. But what we're waiting for is this 14 five-year plan, uh, which is going to pinpoint some of the policies and how it's going to be practically implemented uh, by China. Um, so here in October of this month, uh, the, the party central committee will actually meet to discuss this uh, 14 five-year plan. And uh, if we re review some of, uh, some of the sectors here with a focus on the maritime sector and the green transition, what we can see is that this advanced marine uh, technologies are also very much focusing on the shipbuilding industry. The shipbuilding industry in, in China is the biggest in the world, uh, but they can only maintain this uh, top position if uh, they also advanced in, uh, in some of the key technologies that can support the green transition, uh, because that is uh, hugely a demand by the industry itself, that the, the shipbuilding is, uh, is, is, is done according to the new regulations by the IMO and by other international standards as well. So uh, this is something to, to look out for uh, as well. Um, what we don't know is how advanced uh, logistics and marine industries uh, technologies will fare in this new plan. So, so, so that is, of course, still something that we're looking out for. So more to come on, on that part. If we look at the, mar uh, the maritime sector in itself, um, there is a dominance of the state-owned companies uh, due to the state funding. Costco, uh, which is uh, the, the shipping company, is the world's third biggest container line and has investments on uh, 61 port terminals around the world. I'll show uh, a map a little later. Uh, so it means that the influence of, uh, of, uh, of, of the China investments are heavily uh, and it's expanding uh, globally as well. China's uh, new infrastructure projects um, are also supported by a lot of different measures. It means that there are tax-free uh, zones, there are tax breaks, there are a lot of financing that can be uh, supported, and there's support for R&D and, and, and talents as well 
that means that also Danish companies and European companies uh, can come to China and get support if they link up to some of these uh, Chinese companies uh, as well. And I've just listed a few of the technology areas uh, that are listed in, in these plans uh, as well. Um, if we take a look at the China's onshore logistics, uh, I would say there's a poor efficiency and there's a high fragmentation. Uh, there's definitely a need for also uh, looking into how this can be greened, how uh, the logistics sector and the supply chains uh, onshore, offshore can also uh, get help and support by, by solutions coming out of Denmark or other countries. So uh, there's, a, there's a huge demand also for uh, solutions that can sort of um, can support this very ambitious plan in China that has also been highlighted by President Xi, that actually China wants to be carbon neutral by 2060. So that's very ambitious. Um, so would it make any difference in the US-China relations? Uh, all these different things. Um, we don't know, and we don't know whether this new election of president or if there's a new president is in the US is going to, to make any difference. But what we can see and what is uh, clear to, uh, to all is that the numbers here in China are just uh, amazing. I mean, you have a population which is the biggest in the world. You have a GDP, uh, GDP growth uh, here which is outstanding as well. And in this COVID-19 period that we're in, uh, China is the only big, uh, big economy in the world that has actually uh, managed to to uh, to regain its uh, its its growth rate, or at least a positive uh, growth rate as well. So China is definitely open for business, with the exemption that uh, they're also looking very much into how they can become more uh, self-sufficient. Um, yeah, and and just to support that. Uh, that remark, uh, we have seen a surprising growth in the shipping volumes and the profits in the midst of this uh, pandemic. So uh, global supply chains are, are still uh, very much um, uh, relevant to, to look at. And it's very much also driven by the big e-commerce platforms in, uh, in China. Um, I will skip to this one. Here you can see a, a list of some of the port investments that we see in, in China. So there's a big investment also going in, in that direction. That also means that for our Danish, Danish uh, environmental uh, um, uh, equipment that has to do with uh, uh, port facilities or it could be uh, in, the mar in the marine sector and so on, there's a big demand and there's a big uh, request for looking into 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 these different uh, solutions, um, and maybe just uh, one uh, one little shipping news: uh, China Shipbuilding Group is now the world's largest shipbuilder. So uh, there was uh, this merger in 2019, and uh, this new group actually consists of not not only one or two, but 147 research institutes business units and listed companies with a total assets of uh, 790 billion won and uh, has 310,000 employees. So we are talking about very, very big players. I think due to time, Henrietta, maybe I should just uh, skip to just some key takeaways. Um, China is investing heavily in the maritime sector. So understanding the policies and regulatory framework is key to success in, in China. All Danish relevant stakeholders need to look out for this 14 five-year uh, five year plan, which is coming out, uh, which is covering the period of 2021, 2025. China wants to be carbon neutral by 2060. So they are looking for stakeholders and companies that can actually support that uh, very big ambition. There are opportunities for Danish green and energy efficient solutions and know-how. And this self-sufficient policy uh, is a new normal globally, but uh, critical components are still needed in the maritime sector. And if China shipbuilders don't keep up with the decarbonization demanded by the shipping industries, they risk losing the top spot. And I think that's our claim for fame coming from a Danish perspective, that we do represent a lot of these very good uh, technology-driven uh, uh, companies 
that have looked into a regulatory framework that has to do with uh, lowering emission for a longer period of time. And now the big investment here in China present an opportunity for exactly those uh, stakeholders. I think that's it from uh, my side. I'm sorry if I rushed it through, but it was due to time. And I'm uh, always open to, to take up the dialogue uh, with uh, any of you. So, uh, so we can look into how we can actually support your focus on, on China or the Asian region. Thank you. Thank you so much, Martin. Can you can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Good. Um, this is this is actually one of the things that that, that you're doing uh, in in Shanghai, Martin. If if I'm a Danish company, how can you help me uh, with the knowledge that you have? Could you give an example of that? I think some of the things that we do are, is, is very handheld. So it really depends on the industry that you're focusing on. And it also depends on the kind of interest. So, I mean, it's it's very important for us that we understand the business that uh, that you're in. And there's a product market fit to what you're offering to the market. So basically, I have my uh, my good colleagues, uh, not only the ones in the innovation center, but also at, uh, China, in the China matrix that are here and can, uh, can help. We actually have a growth advisor within the maritime industry as well. So he's basically here to do some of the some of the government to government relations, which is very important in a China setting, and also in understanding who are the key stakeholders to 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 engage with. So we engage with the company and the, and the challenge that they have or the opportunity that they, they they provide, and then we try to understand the product market fit. We set up the meetings uh, here in in China. And uh, it's actually a very good thing to, to be escorted by, by the embassy or, or uh, diplomats because it op opens doors in, in a Chinese settings because we are verifying, you know, for the quality of, of the certain company from the, from the Danish side. Yeah, they have a, they, they are very hierarchically uh, focused in, in China. So it's good to have this support and also especially the, the cultural knowledge, which is slightly different, I presume, than, uh, than the Danish uh, more laid back and easygoing uh, approach to doing business. So Martin, yes, uh, we, we, will, and, we will share your, your also, email. Yeah. And, and, and maybe also sometimes the very direct uh, way of doing oh, yeah. business in a Danish <laughs> setting can, can sometimes be taken down in the wrong way. And, and that's where we also help, of course, with the cultural sort of translation. But uh, we, are, we are very, you know, handheld and we set the team according to, to the company and the needs of the, of the company. And then we provide the network that we have here in, in the local wow. context. That's a, that's a great opportunity. So if any of you out there need to have um, a point of entry to the Chinese market or any of your friends or network, they say, oh, I'd like to... I'd like to, uh, to, to reach out to someone in China, but I don't know where to start. I mean, Martin and, and his colleagues could be a good point of entry and then he can put you in, a, in, a, in, in some direction within his network in China and in South Korea, if, if that could be of interest. I'm sure after three years, you must have a, a, a quite impressive uh, network there. So, uh, so Martin, we will share your email. It's also Martin at now. This is this is your private one you hear, but we will yep. share your your company uh, email yep. in the email that we send out afterwards. So Grace. um I will get into I was like 310,000 employees. It's like a larger. I mean, how in almost how many people are living there? It's like a whole Danish uh, larger city that's in yes. in the largest shipbuilding. Yeah, it's it's so crazy. Uh, this this uh, this scenario you have in China and also the numbers uh, again very impressive that they have uh, come so much back after the coronavirus which after all was started out there and they were quite laid down in the beginning so must be must be a huge work for you to do out there what what is what is what are you gonna start with what is uh, what is your focus area right now what you, you started a couple of months ago I think um... I mean, for, for any of the ICDKs, the innovation centers, we are working within clean tech and life science and broadly ICT. And the, the, the reason for that is basically because we cover, you know, largely the research areas where we have strong positions in Denmark, but we also cover some of the companies and in life science, of course, the pharmaceuticals, but also in clean tech, very much what we focus on from an industry point of view is on green transition. It's on uh, on this transition in, in energy 
um, uh, so it becomes more sustainable. And and we have a long tradition in, in Denmark within this uh, sector that we have some very good companies, uh, of course led by uh, great companies like uh, Danfoss and 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 Grundfos and Velux and others, but also uh, Maersk, of course, uh, with their ambitions and other maritime uh, companies in, in Denmark has sort of paved the way also for an understanding in the industry, also in China, that uh, China wants to link up with the uh, Danish companies in order for them to keep the top spot, as I mentioned before. Yeah. So we are focusing very much on how can we apply our knowledge of technology into sectors whereby we can support the green transition. And, and we see a huge potential in the, in the maritime sector, whereby everything is is uh, is, is being uh, regulated along the lines of being more efficient, being uh, more uh, neutral on on emissions and and so on, but also on safety on board, uh, which is another topic, which is top of mind also from a Chinese point of view. So actually, China and France and Denmark has been invited into the IMU, IMO. To, to take lead on, on some of these things, which is very okay. interesting, also from a Danish point of view. So there's a, there's a lot of uh, interest from, from China's side towards Denmark, and there's a lot of uh, things that we can add and, and add value uh, with from a Danish side. Uh, and and uh, there's a really open uh, invitation, I would say, especially towards the Danish companies, because they know we are, uh, we are okay. quality companies and uh, and uh, technologies and this year uh, Denmark was among the first uh, countries to acknowledge uh, China as a as a as, as a country and create uh, diplomatic ties with uh, with uh, the, the Chinese Republic mm. uh, uh, People's Republic of China so uh, this year we're celebrating 70 years of diplomatic uh, relations so that is also something that we <laughs> use in all our wow. narrative whenever we are supporting Danish companies Great, and and I, when you when you presented these ten, um, what did you call them? Uh, the, the the ten different areas of interest. I I could yeah. count that more than half of them were in within uh, logistics and transport. So yes. you had of course tech and so on, but it was uh, electric cars, it was ships, it <coughs> was uh, um, a lot of different things which was related to to maritime and logistics. Um, of course, also aeroplanes, cars, but it's still yeah. a lot of products that we might have produced for like the car industry that can be used for the maritime industry. Uh, so, so definitely, if you're within that part of the value chain, there are huge pot potential in uh, in China, as I see it. So uh, very much, and I and I think also the sector crossing uh, of is, course. is interesting here, because uh, and and no. All of the ones listening, they they know that uh, on board, of, you know, on on the ships or on the vessels, it represents its own ecosystem. So many of these uh, technologies can be found in from yeah. other industries and applied and, and so on. So innovation is key uh, yeah. to this, uh, but investments are also key. So uh, so I think that's also. I mean, that that was one of the points why I, yeah. I wanted to sort of stress or emphasize also the investment angle on on these things because. Without investments into the green transition and so on, uh, there will not be opportunities uh, as we see now uh, for Danish companies. How long time are you going to stay in China in this um, in this job? Is it is it predefined or? That depends on the resource that I'm going to create. <laughs> <laughs> so it depends on you out there. Go get some yes. uh, nice stuff to Martin. <laughs> No, so I have yeah. a two-year contract, but, uh, Three but hopefully yeah. we have uh, be here for longer. Also, because it has something to do with the family setting and everything, so yes. hopefully it will be four to five years. Um, yeah. But uh, but the innovation is here to stay for for sure, yeah. uh, and and also the collaboration between China and Denmark. And as a last point, maybe uh, Denmark has its biggest educational uh, investment. Uh, linked up to to China partners in the Sino Danish Education Center in okay. in Beijing, whereby yeah. we have different educational programs and we have a lot of talents also. So for Danish companies coming out here, we can actually also uh, create contacts to both Danish students and academia, but oh. also Chinese uh, students and PhDs, which uh, could also be very relevant. 
So CBS uh, Co University of Copenhagen, where are you? You should have listened along to this tidbit. <laughs> so if you They know, they are part of the uh, Stimo Education uh, oh. Center in Beijing. Yes. Okay. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> Good. I have got one question for you. Uh, it's from uh, my dear colleague Tia. She has traveled a lot, also in China, and she says. Um, do you find it realistic to become carbon neutral by 2060? I remember heavy smog in Chinese waters. She has been sailing with masks, so uh, yes. she knows. Yeah. Well, I, I just came home from a business trip to Bentiu, and they were very, uh, that, that's uh, 450 kilometers south of Shanghai. And they were very, uh, you know, they, 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 they were very happy about their the, the clean air and, and the water down there and so on. They have been investing quite a lot, actually. Uh, and, and they are actually a district of uh, manufacturing as well. I think it uh, goes without saying that there is a problem with pollution. And, uh, and that's also what uh, has been acknowledged by the president in China and with the big investments. But they don't... Actually, I, I want to maybe, maybe also uh, give a little gift to the ones that are listening in because we actually produced uh, an ICDK green outlook that was comparing that the climate panel in Denmark has focused on 11 different areas of the importance of green transition from a Danish point of view, also within the maritime sector. So we have compared the investments also in China going into this area and how uh, Danish technologies could be applied into these different areas. And that report is out now and can be shared also with all of you. And you can see how this investment and technologies can also be comparable. But no doubt, there's a lot of challenge on uh, when it comes to, to, to pollution in the air and also in the water. In the water. But, uh, but that also uh, represents an opportunity for, uh, for Danish uh, know-how. So Martin, uh, are there any uh, interesting reports made by you that you could make available or could be found at, at some uh, website? Yes? Yes. Okay, uh, so if you just... Yes. Yeah. So if you just send along the link, uh, yes. I will put it in the email that I sent out to all of you afterwards with the contact info for you, uh, the links to uh, this report, and uh, also a link to your LinkedIn profile. So if people want to follow a little bit uh, what you're doing out there in uh, Shanghai, they can be following you at, um, at your LinkedIn profile. Because um, we have gone slightly a little bit over time, but it was so interesting. And um, I just invite all of you to, to share the link, this crowdcast.io slash uh, Martin Rune Hoxer. So because this will be this has been recorded. So if you want to review the, the slides or if you want to share it with your colleagues or network, uh, feel free to do it. This is free uh, knowledge that we just love to share with all of you out there. So, uh, Martin, thank you deeply for uh, sharing your knowledge. It was really, really interesting. Um, I really got a lot of uh, fantastic knowledge that you can't read in the paper uh, in so short time. So it was really a compressed maggie turning, as we say. Mm. Great, great knowledge. Um, thank you so much for listening along to all of you. Um, and see you next week where we will also dive into the green transition of uh, scan lines. Uh, we have um, uh, the COO who will uh, tell about uh, how uh, scan lines has made um, some, uh, some, some green technologies on their ships. And they have done um, a, a, a few different uh, things. And then we will have uh, Cecilia from uh, from uh, Sweden and she will speak about uh, a little bit me too very uh, very actual um, topic and uh, but in the in the shipping industry and then we have um, Alan Sørensen who is uh, chief analyst at Dansk Industri and he will tell about the new uh, prognosis uh, prognosis uh, in Danish that the Danish industry is uh, coming out with uh, in these days uh, that will be a Danish one, so unfortunately uh, uh, you can't listen along if you are if you don't understand Danish. But um, three nice tidbits uh, for next week are waiting for your lunch, and um, now we're gonna have some lunch and you're gonna have some dinner, Martin, I presume. Yes. <laughs> what time is it at your? It it must be half past six or something like that. Yeah. Yes. Good. Thank you so Good. much for listening along. Thank you, you. Martin, and uh, have Excuse a nice day me. out there. Thank you.